Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host, Greg Moffat, and today I'd like to present episode three of my TV and movie review series, Hauntology and Dystopia. Uh, today I'd like to present uh, two more cultural artifacts from the past. Uh, today it'll be uh, two movies, uh, one representing the 1970s and one representing the 1980s. Uh, first of these is a movie from 1970, and that's entitled No Blade of Grass. This is my DVD edition. I've had this one for many years, over a decade, so I've no idea if there's been any other editions uh, before, actually, or since that may have um, any extras or such like this. just has the basic uh, movie. Now, um, as I say, this came out in 1970, and it's based on a novel by a guy to, uh, called John Christopher, and that was entitled The Death of Grass. And here's my copy, which I read uh, back sometime in the 1980s. This was published in 1956. So quite an early apocalyptic sci-fi story of its kind. Uh, you can see that it's actually got here, uh, the largest title is actually No Blade of Grass, which indicates that this edition came out after the movie. Now, when I read this back in the 80s, I didn't even know there was a movie. It wasn't until I read a sci-fi anthology um, encyclopedia many years later that I found out there was a movie made from this. Now, the movie, the finished film, differs somewhat, as is often the case in these scenarios, um, from the film. Uh, no Blade of Grass itself is considerably more uh, graphic and violent um, than the book. Obviously, book is a book, film's a film, um, but even you know the events in No Blade of Grass um, differ somewhat in their uh, details um, to um, the death of grass. Um, so uh, this is a classic, really, of its of its kind, um, an environmental type apocalypse film from, uh, in this case, nineteen seventy, but from. Uh, the early 70s, as many of you are aware, was a time of um, immense concern about the future of the planet, etc., etc. The oil shock came along in 1974, and there was a tremendous uh, movement towards um, ecological changes at that time. Most of which eventually fizzled out um, as the Carter administration in the US gave way to the Reagan administration that was mourning in America again. Uh, a new oil boom and we entered the 1980s, the decade of the self, and it was consumer uh, explosion time again, uh, gimme, gimme, gimme. Uh, so the um, No Blade of Grass concerns, and <laughs> get, wait for this, as with previous episodes in the series, listen out for things that ring true today, either in the recent past um, or what seem to be looming in the near future. Uh, the story concerns um, a virus uh, which begins somehow gets out into nature, uh, first of all in China, and it devastates, um, as the title indicates, grass species, uh, initially of certain kinds, but eventually of all kinds. Now, grass species, for those who don't know, also include things like wheat and rice, barley, so a lot of human foodstuffs. Um, are involved in this and one of the aggravating factors um, in the outbreak of this virus is that initially the Chinese authorities go for rather than trying to breed resistant strains of grain sorry of grass uh, they go down the pesticide route uh, which mainly uh, serves to aggravate the situation makes it much worse and the parallel with our recent times are, of course, that it is between natural immunity and medicating. And as you know, if you look at how uh, the, the future of antibiotics is panning out, if you just constantly apply antibiotics or other medications to a situation, uh, resistance, whether it's from a virus or bacteria, will develop when you have to apply more and more. And eventually the antibiotic or whatever the medication is can become ineffective. Natural immunity, where possible, is always preferable. But in the film, that's not the route they go down. So, um, of course, uh, a famine begins to develop in China and other parts of East, East Asia. 
and this rapidly begins to spread around the globe. I mean, as we follow the narrative of the film, it does eventually reach all parts of the globe. But of course, it's it, uh, it's relatively fast. But uh, the the events in the film allow us to see that no matter how fast this moves, um, there's still time for people to try and react to it, and that is what the whole story um, hinges on. Now. The film uh, is, I'm not sure if it's an, an American production or an Anglo-American one, but it's, uh, the story was set in the UK and the film uh, was made in the UK with, with mostly um, English actors. And as the situation began, begins to worsen and, you know, it, the, the virus has reached, albeit in initially a limited way, has reached the UK, we get the familiar... Um, suite of government responses which will be very familiar to most of you. Um, rationing begins to come in, uh, we get curfews, um, limited shop opening hours and we get travel restrictions and this eventually um, culminates in entire cities being locked down. I think it's anything over 300,000 go into complete lockdown. Now bear in mind anytime I mention figures about population or most other things Think back to 1970, you have to adjust for that. Um, initially, um, the Australia, New Zealand and the US go into a um, closed border quarantine situation in order to try and prevent the virus from reaching them. Ultimately, they are unsuccessful. Now, our protagonists in our film um, are London-based initially. And um, it quickly bec uh, becomes apparent to them um, that they need to get out. One of them is a government insider and he has the inside track, as you might imagine. And he advises the others, this, you know, this is coming down the line. They're going to lock down the city. It's going to get real draconian. We need to get out. One of the other protagonists has a brother uh, in the northwest of England who runs a, a potato farm, that, which is quite significant. Potatoes are unaffected by the virus. And they decide in their little small group of their, you know, family, close family, that they're going to, in two or three cars, head north, uh, which they do. And one of the early stages of the film sees them actually fighting their way, sometimes physically, out of London um, as roadblocks, uh, you know, as the city goes into lockdown. And they just manage to escape uh, in time. There's one rather amusing scene, somewhat ironic, given what we've all lived through the last couple of years where there's a nightly news bulletin which is shown uh, in, in, in a pub at one point and uh, the, the newsreader is on the screen in the corner and he, he suddenly is live and he breaks into a cough uh, in the middle of his uh, report and he apologises and says, oh, it's uh, it's dangerous to breathe these days, you know, which uh, gave me a laugh. Now, where they're headed for um, in England, for those of you, well, whether you do or do not know um, the geography of England, they're headed for what was once known as Westmoreland. It still is, but in 1974, uh, which was after when the film was made, Westmoreland was incorporated into what's now Cumbria. Extremely beautiful part of England, somewhere I would love to live if I didn't need to be near any um, real infrastructure or population centre. Um, and, oh, and interestingly, I only just found this out recently, Next year, in 2023, Westmoreland is to be reinstituted as a, a municipal area, as it were. So we'll see that again on, you know, council tax bills and, 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 and things like that and signage. So uh, that's just interesting to me, given everything. I, I don't know. I just found it a really interesting factoid. It made me reflect today that, that the Westmoreland that disappeared um, after this film was made is, is coming back. Um, one of the most, um, if there's a hauntological dimension to this film for me, it's a scene as they make their way north, initially uh, in vehicles, but eventually um, on foot for reasons that will become obvious if you use your imagination or indeed watch the film, are as they make their way across the Yorkshire Moors. And it was just striking how unchanged they look. So you got footage from there and you know, shot in 1970, and you could go and shoot in those places now and it would be the same, including one of the big viaducts that's a famous one that runs uh, through part of um, Yorkshire. And it was just, when they were shooting, you know, there was a scene, quite a pivotal scene that takes place there. And it really took me back, like just, to, 
it was uh you know like a like a peak moment when i suddenly thought oh my god you know i was there <laughs> a year ago and i could have been there right now even the, the, the it's almost like i recognized some of the blades of grass that were still left um so uh another really interesting dimension of this film is the government response now we've heard i've said a little bit about that already one of the things the really disturbing things that, that comes out of china is that um in order to um get this apparently ensure the survival of their nation the chinese government have nerve gassed a, a great number of urban centers killing 300 million people bear in mind what i said about adjusting for time inflation so that you have to adjust that pop chinese population in 1970 300 million dead and the government insider says that there, you know there had been talk about this um you know would there need would they need to not just lock down cities but actually exterminate some people in order to ensure their survival and there was talk of using nuclear weapons but of course that'll be complete nonsense because that would destroy everything i don't know anything about much about nerve gas but i think the idea is that it doesn't destroy the environment it just kills people and then dissipates and uh, that's why it's meant to be that's its genius um as a weapon uh, it also raises questions about population reduction because one of the things that's stressed again and again is how um, that this will that the reducing the population by at least half ensures the survival of the rest. And there's many montages in this film of environmental destruction and pollution, and they really lay it on thick. And there's repeated scenes, uh, cutaways of um, uh, people eating meat. It seems to be all about meat and gorging on meat, um, or what's portrayed as gorging. Really, they're just having a you know they're just at a carvery having Sunday lunch. Um, so, but it's all about. Um, too many people, too many things, too many cars, too many smokestacks, too too much of everything. Um, another interesting wrinkle for me is this being set in the UK. One of the first things the protagonists do as they're leaving London is one of them knows a guy who owns a gun shop. Again, a rare thing in this country. And he goes there and tries to get some hunting rifles. Um, they end up actually having a gunfight in the shop. But that emphasizes the difference uh, with gun laws in different parts of the world. I think the whole idea in the US, if you have this sort of breakdown scenario, think, for example, um, albeit this is like an enemy invasion, a film like Red Dawn, um, you know, the country's armed to the teeth, no matter what. In the UK, there's a handful of people with like shotguns and a few rifles and things for shooting vermin on farms. And there'll be a few gun specialists, but very, very few weapons. So that really the government have the monopoly on, on violence as far as uh, guns are concerned. And uh, but guns do pay a, play a pivotal role in this film in terms of like attack and defense and people's survival uh, ends up depending on them being armed uh, with, you know, weapons. Um, it's also interesting how quickly um, it gets into a, a them or us situation. Um, there's quite some quite graphic violence in this film and, and people, even our protagonists, you know, family people, um, basically executing other people to get their food and get their weapons is quite surprising in a way you know because in these even in these sorts of um apocalyptic aftermath films they try to have some kind of um engagement with uh, some lead characters that you can empathize with them and you certainly can to some degree with people in this film but you get you know the main characters like just shooting a farmer and his wife dead just to get their guns and take their food and um and that they get to that point very, very quickly, actually, in the film. And one repeated theme that comes up in the news reports, you never see any of this happening in, in the UK scenario, but from the uh, from the Far East and eventually throughout most of mainland Europe, they get repeated reports initially over the television, but eventually when that goes away by radio of cannibalism, um, which is something, again, when you start to watch the film, you don't expect it to, to really to get to that point. There's also a controversial uh, scene, which I don't remember being in the book, but it, it was put into the film and it is, it's cut from some editions of the film, but there's a quite a graphic rape scene, uh, a gang of marauders uh, raping one of the protagonist's wives and his 16 year old daughter, um, who at that point was a virgin. And it, it's, you know, it, it's sustained for several minutes. 
not quite like in, in straw dogs, uh, but nevertheless, um, it's uh, it led to the film. I think with some of the graphic violence and that rape scene, some people will call the film, um, you know, it's gone from the book to becoming an exploitation film. I think that's going a bit too far. I think it's a good film in its own right. Um, exploitation films wouldn't bother with so much, um, you know, extrapolation and uh, um, padding out of the story and characterization, etc. Um, so the idea is that uh, these guys are making their way to Westmoreland to a their one of the protagonist's brother who has a potato farm, which is located in a valley, uh, which is um, quite narrow at its entrance, extremely narrow at the other end. Um, they it's easily defended and they have built defences. And when they eventually arrive there, um, they've gathered quite an entourage on the way. Quite a few people have been killed, but they pick up some people along the way. The idea being that, well, we can't survive just with a handful of us. We do need to have a community of some sort. So they recruit people along the way. But when they arrive at the farm, um, the brother says that there's too many people. Now, there's some conversations off to one side. You know, It's not in front of everyone. And um, they try... They try to strike a deal. I mean, long story short, spoiler alert, by the way, uh, the lead protagonist ends up killing his own brother. Uh, just as things turn out, he didn't want it to be that way. And he ends up uh, taking over the valley and roll credits. And was that, as with all these films, you're left with more questions than answers, really. Like, what is the future there? What sort of future can they possibly have? Um, will the virus go on to mutate and infect other forms of plant life, in which case there really is no future whatsoever, uh, will it somehow fizzle out? Um, but even then, if you have billions of people around the world um, and all that destroyed infrastructure and people who've resorted to cannibalism, even just on a psychosocial emotional level, it's not easy to come back from that. Um, so yeah, you're looking at a devastated world. And there's one scene actually in the movie which reminded me of uh, one issue in the series Survivors, which I reviewed, uh, which is there's there's a lady who is pregnant and she gives she gives birth to a child stillborn. And uh, it emphasizes how it, all medical care, um, not just childbirth, but all medical care, medicines, and all the infrastructure and power and all the things that we take for granted that keep our lives as we see them around us now, keep that afloat. If those go away, do we even know um, how to cope with that? That remains to be seen. Okay, so the second item I would like to present today is a 1985 movie called The Quiet Earth. This is my DVD edition. I've not seen any other, um, but if there are any out there, um, do let me know, especially if they've got, once again, if they've got any extras. Um, this is a New Zealand production, um, mostly New Zealand, not many actors in it, actually. Mostly New Zealand actors, production staff, and it's loosely based on a 1981 novel of the same name by an Englishman, actually an expat who moved out to New Zealand. Um... Now, this the story here um, is loosely based, sorry, not loosely based, it's loosely based on the novel of the same name, but it has great similarities to, if you want to get a grounding, get a handle on this straight away, um, if you think the movie I Am Legend, I'm thinking more of uh, Richard Matheson's novel rather than any of the subsequent movie remakes uh, under various names such as The Last Man on Earth, uh, Omega Man, etc, etc. Also, uh, Similarities with another movie that predates it by some time, uh, The World, The Flesh and The Devil, which is well worth a look. Now, this is another um, basically apocalyptic, um, you know, earth, massive earth change uh, type story that I found incredibly affecting. You watch this film, you'll never forget it. And it stuck with me for, well, since I first saw it sometime back in the 80s on television. And I've watched it many times since, and it just never departs your consciousness. That's how I found it anyway. So I'll be really, really interested to hear from any of you, if you do check this out, what you make of it. So, the film starts um, 
it concerns um, a scientific project uh, called uh, Project Flashlight. And this is uh, the main research centre appears to be based in New Zealand, possibly because of its remoteness. Uh, maybe it's something to do with the um, electromagnetic field of the Earth. But the project is designed to test and possibly construct a global wireless energy grid for military purposes to control military equipment, you know, in this using this grid. Um, the film begins uh, with our protagonist, um, who's one of the project scientists, and he awakes in the morning finding that he's late for work uh, because his alarm hasn't gone off. He notices that it's stuck at 12 minutes past six and uh, didn't go beyond that. And um, so he's just disorientated at first. Um, so he decides to turn on the radio, I think ostensibly to maybe find out what time it actually is, catch up with the news or whatever. Um, but there's nothing on the radio. Tunes back and forward on the dial. Total silence. So already it's clear that this is a day unlike any other. Um, so he gets himself up and um, decides just to head for work anyway at the research facility. But the uh, first thing that happens when he gets outside um, is he notices at first that there's no one else there whatsoever and that the place is eerily silent. Uh, there's no people, no birds, no animals, no movement, there's nothing, no activity. He lives in a city. He can't hear a thing. So, okay, what's going on? So he drives to the research facility, um, admits himself into the laboratory, uh, finds his superior lying dead in the laboratory. So there's, here's someone, albeit they're dead. And there's a readout on one of the computers simply saying, Project Flashlight Complete. That's it. So he sits down, he, he obviously knows what the project's about and how it works, and he records uh, himself uh, giving his thoughts at that point, because he's a scientist, he knows he needs to record these things for reference. And um, he, because he doesn't know what's going on yet, but he knows that something has happened, he labels what has happened, whatever has occurred, the effect. And throughout the film, he refers to it as the effect. So um, we then follow him over about a week as he roams the place, unable to find anyone else or anything going on, no life whatsoever. And this gradually begins to affect his mental state. And we see him begin to de degenerate, actually, as you might well do in these circumstances, you know, because not only do you appear to be the only person left alive, there aren't even any other, it's not like there's bodies anywhere, there's just nothing. So he begins a descent into what looks like, well, it is insanity, uh, which culminates in him almost committing suicide. He gets as far as having a shotgun in his mouth, but something in that seems to snap him out of his craziness. And from that point on, he goes back to being a sort of more rational scientific mode and decides that there's further work he can do here to try and find out what's gone on. You know, he hasn't explored even the whole of his relatively small country yet. Um, and then this is where it, there's a shock moment, very much like I Am Legend, um, where he first discovers another living, living human being and eventually discovers um, a second one. So there's three of them. Um, one's a man, one's a woman. And a lot of the dynamics, uh, or you know, sort of sub-dynamics of the film thereafter involve the sort of two's company and three's a crowd idea. And um, the viewer's mind quickly goes to the idea, especially when he met the woman and the, the, the man hadn't showed up yet, the other man. <clears throat> he began to think of like Adam and Eve scenarios Oh, well, that's where my mind went anyway. I thought, well, if, if the whole, you know, population of the earth is somehow being raptured, you know, just quote unquote, <laughs> they're just gone. Um, is this it? And of course, we know you cannot repopulate uh, the earth uh, or any, you know, <laughs> sizable community with just, you know, a, a male and female specimen. Uh, genetically, that will not work. You'll end up with a, just a race of mutants. And um, interestingly, um, 
it's then another subtext is that why are these three still alive and are there others? And it turns out that these three have something in common. Basically, when the effect um, took place, there was something that united the three of them that meant that they survived. What is that? And as time goes on, and they, the, the, the three are exploring their environment, trying to figure out, again, what's going on, we start to see strange uh, environmental effects on a very big scale. The laws of physics begin to warp. We see strange, just ripples in reality. The sun begins to behave in strange ways. Um, solar surges, just strange sunspots, are just weird behavior at, the, at first of the margins of um, the environment, but increasingly making itself felt. And it becomes clear to the scientist that it's possible that the effect will happen again. And he, because they, they, couldn't, they didn't predict it the first time, he's no idea what might happen second time. So he decides they need to destroy Project Flashlight, the facility. And one of this is probably the, the, the physical culmination of the film is that they get together um, a massive amount of explosives loaded onto a truck and they then drive that into uh, Project Flashlight and as it happens, they do so at the exact moment that the effect happens for the second time. What occurs? You have to watch to find out. At the end, again, spoiler alert, if you want to watch the film, turn off now. At the end, the scientist finds himself alone again on a beach. He knows not where. On the horizon, out across the sea he sees strange cloud formations that he does not recognize and rising above the horizon a large ringed planet that looks very like Saturn and again more questions and answers about this has the protagonist been moved to a new planet a different location has the entire earth been moved to a different location in the solar system or even beyond it. We just don't know. Um, in the end, the meaning in all of this is left up to the viewer. And that's one of the things I like about it most. And one of the things I think that modern viewers might find so frustrating about it, because, you know, they don't put films like this on, in, you know, big cinemas anymore because people wouldn't be satisfied. You know, uh, they, they'd be dribbling into their popcorn and wanting their money back if they were left with an ending like that. But um, even though it's, the, 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 you know, the protagonist seems like mystified and even despondent, um, I think it's, you know, cinematically, it's one of the most beautiful endings I've ever seen. Uh, and it reminds me in a way of, in a different way, that the, the movie Men Call, uh, Melancholia, um, some of the moments in that are so beautiful. Uh, there, I don't, don't ask me why. <laughs> Do see Thomas Sheridan and Neil Hamilton's joint analysis of this in one of their joint uh, YouTube videos. But there's a bit where in Melancholia, where the, the planet is drawing, the planet that will destroy the Earth is drawing closer and closer to the Earth that I find strangely beautiful. Um, and the ending also reminds me of, again, only in terms of um, um, its, its nature. I suppose, in terms of how it leaves you with, with, with questions and with, with your own imagination, the films of John Carpenter, where it's just like, well, that's it. End of. The story ends here. It doesn't. But this chapter ends here. What happens after this? Well, you know, you make up your own story from this point on. And the film itself, I think, has been highly influential, whether consciously or subconsciously, um, on future filmmakers, certainly things like uh, 28 Days Later and other other films of that nature. Um, so uh, that's today's presentation. Just to remind you, uh, we looked at um, No Blade of Grass based on the novel by John Christopher, The Death of Grass, uh, which is worth a read, you know, whether or whether or not you check out the movie. And we've just looked at The Quiet Earth. 
Both of these films I can thoroughly recommend. So, that's it for today. Until next time, you've been listening to Legalise Freedom. I'm Greg Moffat. Legalizefreedom.com.